I'm going to take you through uh, the radiology OSCE, and I'm aware that my experience of uh, examining may well be different from your experience and, and what you'll be expected to do um, in your medical schools. And I know that uh, the experience or what's expected is different in different places. I'm going to focus on a model which is based on a, a pure radiology OSCE, so a station where you're given some clinical information and expected to then interpret uh, some imaging. But I do understand that uh, things may be different in your medical school. You may be uh, given a much larger sort of clinical scenario. So I'll take you through some of the OSCE scoring formatting and give you a little bit of an insight uh, to, to what the examiners might be expecting. Um, then I'll talk you through the systematic approach, uh, which you probably all know, but just to remind you, and then give you some specific tips relating to the radiology OSCE and uh, a little bit about radiology etiquette, which I think will help uh, um, you scoring. I'll take you through some sort of classic cases uh, that you may expect to encounter, um, and then just talk about the further resources that are available to you at the Radiology Masterclass. A pure radiology um, OSCE may give you some clinical information, which you just have a, a couple of minutes to, to look at. You'll be expected to demonstrate a systematic approach to interpreting the imaging, but that's not all that the radiology station is about. Really what I think the examiners are looking for is your ability to uh, take the radiology information or uh, what you've gleaned from the interpretation and fit it together with the clinical information that you've been provided. And then actually to come up with a plan of what you would do. You may be given some, some questions to answer as well, of course. So just to mention the, the further resources, I, I'm going to be referring to some of the things, uh, uh, resources that are available in Radiology Masterclass. If, you, if you're not aware of the website, then please do visit. It's, I, I've designed it really specifically for you guys to help you get through medical finals and also to be uh, useful to you as studio doctors. Um, and I hope that you've uh, come across it and you, you, you use it because... Um, a lot of the information, or most of the information on there will be very relevant to what you're going through at the moment as you prepare for finals. And it's under the test yourself section there, but I'll refer to this again at the end. There are links also to some OSCE examples and some of the uh, OSCE presentation tips that I'm referring to here are also listed there with scoring uh, checklists. Material on the website that's relevant here really would be chest x-rays, which I think are a favourite of, of OSCEs. Um, but also abdominal x-rays. Some places I, I'm sure will do other imaging modalities like CT brain. At the moment, we don't have anything in place regarding ultrasound, which I, I think is would be less likely, but still possible. This is the sort of checklist that the examiner will have, and you will be expected to go through all of this. This is a sort of tick box, and every tick that, that you get it will be in your favour. Things like you know, accurately assessing the heart size, identifying the patient and make sure the time is right and all, all those things you'll get a point for each of those elements and it's important that you don't ignore that and that's the reference for where that checklist is more importantly i think uh, from an examiner's point of view is your overall global score that you'll you'll get one thing that's really important for you to appreciate that is the examiner is on your side and the examiner wants you to to to, to get through, not least because we, we don't want to do, <laughs> examiners don't like doing paperwork. So if you if you score uh, you know, lower, this is, this is the model I'm, I'm aware of and, and have been involved in. If you score D or below, then, then that will be looked at. And um, the examiner will have to specifically write reasons as to why you've uh, done poorly or unacceptable or failed. And actually, it's quite difficult for a purely radiology station to allow you to shine and become excellent, but also allow you to fail. And there are very few scenarios where you would just outright fail. That, but there are some that you need to be aware of, particularly things like you no know, tension pneumothoraces, that sort of thing. So uh, this is one, the one example that's on the website. Uh, very likely a similar sort of thing that you, you, you'll be uh, asked to look at and you won't be given that much time um, to pick up all the information that you need. But it's important that you're, you're aware that the scenario that you're um, gonna be looking at or the image you're gonna be looking at is not, it's not a test of you being a radiologist, it's a test of you being a day one F1 junior doctor. And your ability to dovetail things together and bring things together, the history of the examination and what the question is. I think this is a very good uh, approach to 
when you are day one at an F1 or to even any doctor at any stage, this is how you should think when you're re requesting any radiological examination. You should provide information about the history, in, a, in other words, the symptoms, the current symptoms and anything in the previous medical history. You should uh, tell us about the examination, uh, what you found on the examination as much as possible, knowing that people, some people are difficult to examine, particularly if they're unconscious, and then come up with a specific question. And if you, if you look at the uh, clinical information that you're given, what you need to do ideally is to pick out what elements there are from the history, what elements there are from the examination, and what you think the question might be. And that's relevant even before you, you've gone into the uh, OSCE room. And I think very often you will have a very high level of suspicion that you're gonna see this sort of image or that sort of image or even a number of images of different parts of the body. So, um, and it's not cheating to know that, <laughs> it's actually what's expected of you. And, and I think that the, the clinical information you're given may be quite verbose, maybe long-winded, but you would be expected to pick out the relevant things from that and also be aware that there shouldn't be anything there in there that is actually misleading. Most of that information will be, will be useful to the scenario. Um, to provide anything that's that's uh, additional and misleading, I think would be un would not be um, uh, acceptable really from an examination point of view. So this is a sort of you may get this sort of image. This is again taken from the first example on the Radiology Masterclass website. You're just asked to present the findings, um, and I'll take you through how to do that. Then you may get some questions. Importantly, I think it's uh, it would be good for you to actually anticipate what those questions might be and even to answer them before they've been asked. Having said that, um, OSCE examinations are very rigid. Um, examiners are not allowed to go off piece and ask all sorts of questions. Some are tempted to do that occasionally. So um, if they do that, it's probably a good sign because it means you've passed. Because um, if you uh, failed and you complained and, they, and said, well, they asked me this question, they didn't ask that to anyone else then the examination, uh, that, would, that would go in your favour. But if there are questions that you can anticipate, you need to say that before, before the, 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 um, you're given the chance to actually, or the examiner asks them. If they ask them because they, they have to, then you just need to answer them again. And again, on the website, this is uh, just uh, to show you, after the, the OSCE scenarios on the website, you can see an, some explanation of what you can see in the, in the images there. Um, and also the answers to any questions given, and also some discussion about what makes a good, uh, an average or um, a poor candidate. So the systematic approach in, in radiology, you all should have some uh, understanding of what that means. Um, but if not, and if you want to brush up on that, then there's a tutorial specifically about this on the web website. So. Just a, an example of some clinical information. Here we have, uh, this is boiled down into uh, just a bullet point. And if you can do this in your head, um, then that's, uh, that's gonna go to your advantage. And what you're gonna do is get, get to the point where, where you're going, what the heck is going on? What is the history? What's the examination? And what's the question? What's the question that's forming in my mind? The only information you have here about examination is that the patient has clubbed fingers. I suppose hemoptysis, there might be some blood in, in the sputum pot, exactly. I know that's a symptom and a sign to some degree, but everything else is, a, is, is in the history. So the question here is pretty straightforward and you all should be uh, able to, to say, well, does this patient have cancer, lung cancer? Um, if you're thinking of club fingers and if it makes you think of fibrosis, put that to one side because club fingers in a smoker, that's gonna be lung cancer. Don't think of the rare thing, think of the common thing first. So here we have uh, an image and I've deliberately given you an image of a, with a diagnosis that you've never come up with, uh, you've never seen before. And I've put this in place so that we can specifically go through the, the, the systematic approach without getting distracted by a specific disease entity. Clearly you're going to want to talk about the, the elephant in the room as soon as you can. But you have to get points first. You have to pick up the, those checklist points. And to do that, you have to, first of all, identify the image. You need to say, this is a plain chest radiograph. It's a, a PA view or posterior anterior view taken of Bob Smith 
His date of birth is the 1st of the 1st, 1971. His hospital number is 01234567. It was taken on the 13th of March, 2021 at 10.45. You know that you're going to say that, or words to those effect, before you go into the exam. So you, you have lines at your disposal. You, have, you don't even have to engage your brain. You can, you can speak from the spinal cord. Uh, that's not correct neurology, but you know what I mean? You don't have to think about what you're going to say. You know that that's what you're going to do. First off, you're going to identify the image and make sure that you've got the right time and date. If it doesn't have a time, then it may be that there's not another image, but if it does have a time, it may be a clue that there is another image to look at. And just be aware of that. And it's a good thing to say, first of all, the imaging in, in, re in real life, we never look at imaging in isolation of other medical notes. And that includes the radiology notes themselves or the radiology record. And so you can say things like, I would like to refer to previous imaging or subsequent imaging if it's available. So here you still want to get on to talking about the elephant in the room as quick as possible, but you still have to comment on adequacy. Now, many people spend way too long wasting time talking about adequacy of the image in an exam in the OSCE setting. It would be unfair, I think, for the, examiner, uh, the examiners to give you uh, images which are of poor quality. I suppose they may give you something that's of poor quality and with the expectation, if it's so bad that it's not diagnostic, then perhaps they're testing you to, to say, oh, is there another image or is there a subsequent image? But I, I think that that is, would be pretty tough and I, I doubt that they would do that. I recommend to students that they say the image is of adequate quality. It's not rotated, there's good inspiration and a good penetration. And you should know about um, how to assess rotation, medial ends of the clavicles and uh, the spinous processes in the midline, inspiration, counting ribs and just making sure that the Hemidiaphragms are domed and not too flat uh, with hyperinflation uh, or uh, hyperexpansion of the lungs, or that you've got too, too few ribs uh, um, showing up the top. And also penetration, the best place to look is in these, behind the heart in the left paravertebral area and checking that you can see the diaphragm coming all the way in here. So this is a very nicely penetrated image. And I know it's, it's, it's normal because this is my own chest x-ray taken 15 years ago. So you've, you've done the demographics, you've done the quality, and now you have to talk about the elephant in the room. Yeah, although you're gonna pick up points for doing the systematic approach, it's really important that you start with the thing that is standing out first, because if you don't, the examiner is gonna be feeling quite anxious that you haven't spotted it. So you need to go for the first thing, and I would avoid use of the term, the most obvious thing or the most striking thing, and just say, the first thing I'd like to comment on is the large elephant-like mass or opacity that is a, appears to be arising from the right hilum, and then describe it as much as you can. It appears to have two tusks and a, and a trunk. It has elephant-like ears and large feet. I can see the eyes. I can see the skin that looks elephant-like. And uh, so you describe it as much as you can. And then you move on and say the words, I am now looking at the rest of the image systematically. And then whatever your particular system, there's no right or wrong way of doing it. You'll probably pick up the points as you go along. You talk about the trachea, the airways, the hilar structures, um, the left hilum being normal. You can talk about the heart contour, the heart size, being less than 50% or the CTR um, cardiothoracic ratio being normal. You can talk about the plural edges, the cosphenic angles. Interestingly, my cosphenic angles here are only just on the image here. You can see down here, only just, they only just got that on. Um, so, and actually it's important to mention that perhaps when you're talking briefly about um, the adequacy of the image, just to make sure that everything is on, on the image. You need to compare the right and left uh, upper mid and lower zones, clearly the, the right mid zone or the higher area is abnormal in this case. And also compare the same side zones with the, the adjacent zones. So you're comparing the density of the lungs or the attenuation in the lungs in the upper, mid and lower zones and comparing uh, side by side also. 
And then don't forget things like the bones. The bones are really important. So if you've got a, an area of abnormality, you certainly want to check the ribs behind it or the, or the, the vertebrae if it's visible and say, say what you're doing. It's, it's a driving test. You have to talk as you're going. Uh, soft tissues, anything else, anything around the edge of the image, just double check there. And I would say all, all of you that it's, it's well worth saying uh, and proving that you are safe by saying, I can see no evidence of a pneumothorax. So you can check up, up at the APCs um, for a small pneumothorax. And I can see no evidence of gas, free gas under the diaphragm. And, and that sends a very nice message that you are safe, that you're thinking about life-threatening things. Um, this elephant is probably then for a while, it's not gonna kill this patient uh, any, any minute. But there are things that you need to exclude important things, particularly in the exams, and particularly pneumothoraces and free gas, because those are favourites in the OSCE setting. So this, these are some specific tips relating to the OSCE station, and some of them I've referred to already. Um, you need to talk. Now, this might sound obvious, but if you come into the room and start looking at the image without talking, then you're not scoring any points. You can't score any points without talking. So as I said, you need to come in, you need to smile and say hello to the examiner, be friendly, and then look at the image, but you need to start talking pretty quickly. And you know that you're going to talk about the details on the image. So look at those, uh, those details, anything that the image can tell you about what's going on, whether it's a PA, posterior anterior, anterior posterior, whether it's um, you know, erect or if it was taking a resuscitation or those sort of things, you need to start unpacking it as soon as you possibly can. And while you're doing that, your brain will be processing what's, what's on the image and where you're going to start. So learn your lines. You're gonna say all your lines about the image details and the quality, and you know you're gonna say that before you get in the exam. And then say the first thing to comment on, I would avoid use, using most obvious or the most striking because it may be the most striking to you, but it may not be the most striking thing to the radiologist or whoever is examining you. So just say, I'd like to comment on this first, and that's fine. As long as it's the, it is the obvious thing to you, then that, that I think would be fine. And then demonstrate your systematic approach, comment on the, the things that are striking first, there might be two or three elements, and then say, I'm now looking at the rest of the image systematically and then you can pick up your your or your checklist points just uh one pointer that helps i think it, you can say image or radiograph i would avoid using the word x-ray and definitely don't use the word film because it is not a film anymore that that's old technology if you are in a setting where uh, you're with an examiner and uh, you may even be given a pointer uh, or something to point at the image with uh, a, a pencil or something it's radiology etiquette not to point at the image without asking permission. So just very briefly say, would you mind if I pointed at the image? And that again is just a marker that you've been taught radiology properly and that you've turned up and paid attention. Whatever you do, you do not touch the image. So if you imagine that the radiology, um, the, image, the image and the surface of the, the digital display is like a sterile field. And this is true in, when you're uh, on the wards or, or coming to radiology, do not touch the screen because we get a bit touchy about that. Particularly in the exam where you may be um, putting a marker, mark of you know, greasy fingers on, on, this, on, the, on the display. And, and, and so even if you've got a pointer, don't, don't actually touch the screen. And importantly, I think you should be aware that there may be other images to look at, previous images or subsequent images for comparison. Exclude life threatening pathology, as I've said, uh, pneumothorax and, and free gas, and, and say that clearly if there, there is a pneumothorax, don't say there isn't one. And if you're asked, is there a pneumothorax, you have to look really carefully before saying there isn't. Um, that has happened. Um, and then at the end, what you need to do, and this is what the whole nub of the exam is about, is to bring everything together and to not wait to be asked. You need to say, in summary, this is a plain chest radiograph of Joe Bloggs taken on this day and it shows a classic case of right-sided elephantitis. This fits with the clinical information of whatever it is and then say what you would do, it, particularly if it's in a medical emergency, if it's a tension pneumothorax, you need to say I would treat this as a medical emergency, I would call the team, I would go to the patient, I would 
start, I would initiate resuscitation, I would check their airways, their breathing, their circulation, I'll give them oxygen and so on and so forth. I would get a chest drain ready, whatever it might be. I would follow guidance of the British uh, Thoracic Society for treatment of uh, pneumothorax. Don't wait to be asked because examiners uh, are nervous by, uh, uh, by candidates who are not prepared to sort of take responsibility. And it is, you need to put yourself in that position of day one being an F1. Many, patient, many um, candidates will say um, something like, I would call my team and ask their advice. And that's fine, but that's not what you're being examined on. You're being examined on what you would do as a, as a day one uh, junior doctor. So you need to assume, yes, say I would call my team, but then if they're not available, what would you do? Um, and I think that's, that's the uh, essence of what you're being examined on, to try and bring everything together and try and anticipate those questions before you've been asked them. So we're going to go through as many cases as we can. So we're asking what the heck is going on here? What's the history? What's the examination? It's the same as before. The examination here is club fingers. The question is going to be, is this patient, does this patient have cancer? So here you would describe your uh, demographics and the image quality and go straight into talking about this large mass up here and just say there's a large rounded area of increased density in the left upper zone around the uh, upper hilum. It appears to be speculated around the edge. It appears to be uh, to blend into the aorta here and describe it as much as you can. And then say, I also notice multiple areas of rounded density throughout both lungs. And my concern, say, say what your concern is. My concern is here that this would represent a large bronchogenic primary malignancy with metastases to the rest of the lungs. And then you'd go through and do, do all of your other things, picking up the points about heart size and making sure that you've ruled out a pneumothorax and free gas on the diaphragm. This gas down here is within a small, small bowel, I think. And just to show you uh, the speculation on that case, there's a bit, bit of a close up. You can see speculation around here. And here, here are the, the lung nodules, lots of lung nodules. So you would then go on to you know, say what you would do about that. The patient would be needed to be referred to the right people and uh, given whatever symptomatic control and uh, worked up for lung cancer and, and staging and that sort of thing. Next patient is a uh, 71 year old. Now there are some clues in here, and this is a trick that examiners do. They fall while visiting relatives. That's a clue. That means that this, this patient has no other medical records and they're not gonna tell you what's going on. They're found unconscious, which means that the patient can't give you, is unable to give previous medical history. So this is gonna be more about your ability to unpack from the radiological evidence. Um, they have a shortened and externally rotated leg and they are dull to percussion at the right lung base. So there's a lot going on here. First of all, they're unconscious or they've, been, they've had an episode of unconsciousness that we need to worry about. And they've got this ro rotated leg, uh, which should make the question here, uh, following uh, history and examination, the question is, is this a hip fracture? Um, and delta percussion is well, something that's going on at the right lung base. So some helpful information here. And it may be that we're going to uh, want to see more than uh, one x-ray here. So, and it may also be that you go into the uh, scenario and they ask you what imaging would you like? Say, for example, we had here a, um, uh, the, the a hip x-ray or a pelvis x-ray. And again, you've done your demographics, you've said it's uh, adequate quality, it's very easy to look at the quality, it's just not rotated, much easier than on the chest x-ray. And you can see here, there's a fracture coming through here, we can see mottled, uh, low density, uh, sort of a moth-eaten appearance. And this is a pathological fracture, you can see it's, it's not particularly displaced, but there's a line coming through here on the background of a very moth-eaten looking, looking leg. And you can describe that and, and say all your concerns and here we have the chest x-ray and there's lots to talk about in here. So we've got this pleural effusion here. You've got the meniscus sign here. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with that. And that, that would fit with the dullness at the, at the lung base. You've also got a very big heart. And this is all about this, this, this lack of clinical information. You'll be asked to unpack this. It's a PHS, so we can assess the heart size. Um, on that side, the heart is way out here, nearly touching the chest wall. On this side, there are two heart borders, um, one there and one there, which should ring some bells for you. We've also got some um, 
uh, artifact. Artifact, by the way, you should probably refer to early on, uh, to probably just after um, talking about, or as part of talking about the image quality, um, otherwise you'll forget to. And this is a mitral valve replacement. And you can see here the carina is splayed beyond 90 degrees. So this patient has, uh, well, cardiomegaly, probably all chamber, but specifically those evidence of uh, left atrial enlargement. You can talk about the lungs, no, no pneumothorax, no free gas, and there's a pleural effusion. So we've got someone with a pathological fracture and a pleural effusion. We're still worried about malignancy. And the other thing that you may well be asked about in this case is what's the cause of the unconsciousness. Um, so it's possible some of you may, um, I know that some medical schools do test uh, about CT brains. I would think that would be fairly straightforward. It's the same, same thing. You just talk about the, the demographics. You, you need some sort of uh, mechanism for talking about um, uh, quality in the brain. There's, there's, uh, there's this um, tutorial you can look at. If you know that you're going to be asked about uh, CT brains, then I would suggest just reading that tutorial. And that, uh, this patient had some enhancing lesions showing that she, ha uh, she has metastases as well. So ne next patient, 56 year old, onset of chest bending, shortness of breath, non-smoker, increased heart rate, asymmetric chest signs. So the asymmetry um, is telling you that uh, they're not going to tell you which side the abnormality is on. So what's going on here? The history is in the chest pain, shortness of breath, non-smoker, uh, and examination, increased heart rate uh, and not very much information. So what's going on here? Uh, there's, a, there's a whole load of things that could be going on here. It's pretty non-specific. But if we're talking about chest, we're, we're gonna be worried about um, you know, heart disease, we're gonna be worried about infection, we're gonna be uh, worried about cancer. And as soon as you come into the OSCE, that hopefully will become a little bit more uh, apparent what's going on here. So hopefully you all know that this is a pneumothorax, a, good, a, 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 a large pneumothorax. You need to know the definition of a small and large simply at the level of the, the hilum. The, the width here is greater than two centimeters. Now, pneumothorax is not the same as collapse. Do not use the word collapse because if you do, you will rightly be marked down for that. A collapse of the lungs is where you have endobronchial disease with, with occlusion and failure of expansion of that part of the lung. So don't, if, if you're talking about a pneumothorax, you can talk about compression of the lungs, of, of air in the pleural space compressing the lungs, but um, don't, don't call it collapse. You may be given a subsequent image, for example, um, with a chest drain in situ, that sort of, like you, you ask what, what would you do, and this would be your answer. The next patient, uh, non, very, very little that's helpful here. Um, Non-smoker with the worst thing of chest pain, what's going on here? So we're, we're thinking again of some sort of chest pathology. And this, this would be, I think, beyond uh, the scope of most uh, finals OSCEs. Uh, this is a much more difficult case. You may be given some more clues than the clinical information that I've given you here. But again, you're gonna go through your sy system. You may not see anything that is uh, striking in the, in, in the, in the system. So you have, that's when you have to rely on your system, but don't panic. I think it's unlikely that you're going to be given an, a normal image, um, but I suppose that is possible. I think that would be un, a bit, un, bit unreasonable again. You're going to talk about heart size and pick up all the points for, for comparing bits of the lung. And then you might see a bit down here, a little bit of a band of atelectasis down here. You might pick up that there's some distortion of this rib. And then hopefully, once you've gone through the system and you get to the bones, you realise that here there's something going on. And you can see the first rib, you can't really see the second rib. And then there's this increased density here. You may also notice that some of the bones are a little bit strange. So this is where you need to refer to previous imaging if it's available. Um, and just say, um, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. One, one thing that lots of, lots of candidates are not sure about density or size of higher structures, and that can be very difficult. If you're not sure about something, say you're not sure and say, I would like to refer to previous imaging because that is exactly what would happen in real life and would probably answer the question. And then if you're still not sure, you can say that you, know, you would do other imaging. So here's a bit of a close up just to, to show you here and in, in greater detail what's going on there. And we're worried about some disease of bone. And here's the previous imaging. And you can see here, that the, the, the ribs here are much more easily defined. The second rib there can be seen throughout. This was taken about three years ago. 
And here you can see that the, the rib is destroyed. And this is where I, if, if you were in the room with me, I'll put you on the spot and ask you what this, this was. And uh, hope, I'm hoping that you'd uh, pick, pick up this is like to be a case of myeloma. Should we go to questions? Um, yeah, I think there's only a couple. Um, so okay. someone's asked about the um, significance of the two heart borders um, in, in the original, I think it was in the yeah. first case, yeah. Yeah, double right heart border is one of the signs of left atrial enlargement. And there are, there are several, so uh, bulging of the left, left uh, heart border as well and, and, and splaying of the carina. Um, and you know, that patient had a, had a valve, uh, a mitral valve in that as well. Um, and then yeah. the second question is um, in the chest radiograph with the elephant, so I think that was the first one you showed us. Um, it says right in, um, it's labeled right in the top left corner. Um, so you're looking at the x-ray as if you are looking face onto the patient. So the, the, the elephant is on the right side of the chest yeah. and the heart is sort of maybe towards the left side of the chest. Great. And then the final question, I think someone was just asking, I guess, in your experience, are fractures common in OSCE scenarios? No, they're not. No, I, I think um, uh, that I'm aware of uh, maybe one or two cases, but it's only as part of uh, what's going on. Fractures are usually going to be very straightforward to diagnose. It, you know, I think hip fracture might be the most likely one to, to come across. Um, hence, I, that's why I put it in. And um, uh, no, I, I think that it would be, uh, I mean, you can teach people how to interpret f fractures on a wet Wednesday afternoon. It's pretty straightforward. Um, that the obvious ones are anyway. But um, I think that that would, wouldn't, it certainly wouldn't form the basis of the, an OSCE. It may be an element uh, of an OSCE and it may be a way of di differentiating someone who is good from someone who's excellent. Uh, so, but I wouldn't worry about fractures. Thank um, you very much. Um, so unfortunately we are out of time and that is the okay. end of the questions as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. It's my pleasure. On. Thank you so much no, for inviting me. No, no worries. Thank you. And, uh, and good, people... good luck, everyone. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. And if people do want to see more resources, they can always visit your website. Absolutely, yeah, it's there for you. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Graham. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Ed. Take care. Bye.